In the world we know today, computers are used for a multitude of purposes and by a multitude of people. They are capable of fascinating things that astound the mind. What once seemed unimaginable of happening is now customary for our society. Since computers are commonly found in most households now, they are severely taken for granted. Computers, however, have affected the outcome of many important things throughout history, and they now affect the lives of everyone on Earth. Computers are made up of many different parts that all work together in unison. The input and output functions of a computer are basically the communication between your computer and yourself. The inputs are what you send into the computer. The data is then received by the computer and processed. Once the data is processed, it is then outputted back to the user through the use of some device, such as a monitor. The central processing unit, or better known as CPU, is the integrated circuitry that is inside a computer and performs the instructions of a computer program by completing arithmetic logic, control, and input and output. Random access memory, or RAM, is a type of data storage for your computer. RAM allows data to be read and written. RAM is a type of volatile memory, meaning the information that is stored is lost if power is removed. Those are only some of the main components of computers today, even though there are many more parts that make them run the way they do. This short documentary will walk you through the different generations of computers and key people that played a role in their evolution, starting from the beginnings and taking you to where they are today. When people hear the word computer today, they think of the device that they can go on to finish their work, or to wind down and communicate with their friends, or to even play games. Back in the 17th century, before modern technology was around, the term computer meant something different than it does today. A computer was someone who would perform calculations and computations. With these computers performing so many calculations by hand, they were of course bound to make mistakes. This is around the time when one of the first mechanical machines came to be. Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician and inventor who was around during the 17th century. Pascal is most known for being the first inventor of a mechanical machine. Blaise Pascal invented the Pascaline, or maybe better known as Pascal's Calculator. Pascal's Calculator was simply that, a calculator. He went through about 50 prototypes before presenting his first machine in 1645. Pascal's Calculator was able to calculate up to 8 figures by using addition and subtraction. Perhaps its most famous feature was that it was able to carry numbers over. The carryover system allowed an addition of 1 to 9 on one dial, switch out the 9 with a 0, and carry the 1 over to the next dial. Pascal created about 20 of these machines before his death at the young age of 39. Although Pascal's calculator and other devices like it had surfaced, there were still considerable errors being made in calculations. The growing need for accurate computations to be completed without errors was in demand, and introduced one of the most brilliant people into the story of computers, Charles Babbage, who is now known as the father of the computer. On December 26, 1791, inventor, mathematician, and mechanical engineer Charles Babbage was born. Babbage was his own algebra instructor as a child and ended up entering Trinity College in Cambridge by 1811, where he found himself far ahead of his mathematic tutors. By 1821, Babbage had an idea for a machine called the Difference Engine. His Difference Engine would be able to calculate tables and directly print the results with no errors. After a few years, 
only a few parts of the difference engine had been completed, and it quickly started to gain attention. By 1832, there were enough parts to assemble a part of the engine which was able to solve equations perfectly and give six-digit results. Unfortunately, the difference engine met its demise due to skyrocketing costs. However, this did not stop Babbage. Babbage had another idea for a new device called the analytical engine, and it would be far superior to his old design of the difference engine. Babbage's overall design for the analytical engine had many designs that are seen in modern computers today. The mill made the calculations, the store held numbers to be used in the calculations, and instructions and numbers could be filled into the machine using punch cards. The reason we know so much about Babbage's analytical engine is due to Ada Lovelace. Ada had seen a demonstration of Babbage's difference engine and ended up publishing a description of the analytical engine. People often refer to Ada as the world's first programmer because the notes she had taken on the analytical engine contained what is perceived as the first algorithm that was proposed to be carried out by a machine. Only a small portion of Babbage's analytical engine was completed before his death in 1871 and would have ended up being forgotten about completely if it had not been for Ada's notes on the matter. By the time the 1930s had rolled around, World War I had already passed and the Second World War was right around the corner. This is around the time that German inventor and civil engineer Konrad Zuse came into relevancy. Zuse is credited with creating the first programmable computer, the Z1. Zuse began designing his Z1 computer in 1935 in his parents' apartment. He would go on to finish building the final design for the Z1 by 1938. The Z1 was the first programmable computer created, and it used binary floating point numbers and Boolean algebra. The Z1 contained most parts of a modern computer, such as a control unit, input and output devices, and other parts. It was also to be programmed freely by use of a punch tape and punch tape reader system. The Z1 had a 22-bit floating point value adder and subtractor that could also perform more complex tasks such as division and multiplication with some slight control logic. It also contained a 64-word floating point memory where the Z1 would be able to read from and write to each word of memory by use of the control unit. The Z1 never ended up functioning as well as intended due to it containing around 30,000 metal parts which led to inadequate mechanical accuracy. By the time Zeus had completed his work on the Z1 machine, he was called to serve in the military. The military would provide Zeus with funds in order to continue his research, which led Zeus to creating three more machines the Z2, Z3, and Z4. Unfortunately, Zeus's original devices, the Z1, Z2, and Z3, were all destroyed by a British air raid in 1943. Replicas of the Z1 and the Z3 were made, and they now sit in museums for everyone to see. The similarities that computers had in the first generation consisted of using vacuum tubes for circuitry. These machines were more than often massive in size, generally taking up a whole room. Along with their excessive cost and their abundant use of electricity, they also generated a good amount of heat, which led to many malfunctions. These computers also counted on machine language in order to complete tasks and operations. 
Input was provided through the use of paper tape and punch cards, and output was shown on printouts. One of the first computers designed during the first generation of computers was done so by a man named Thomas Flowers. Flowers was a British engineer who created his device during World War II in order to help decrypt German messages. Flowers' machine was called the Colossus. The Colossus was the world's first electronic programmable computer. It used vacuum tubes in order to read paper tape and then administer programmable logic functions. By the end of the war, there were around 10 Colossus machines being used to aid the Allied forces. Most of these machines would later be destroyed in order to pertain secrecy. Without the creation of the Colossus machines, the Allied forces would have missed out on an abundance of important military intelligence that was obtained by the decryption of messages sent between Germany's high commanders and their army forces. Still during the World War II era, the world's first digital computer came to be. This computer was to be financed by the United States Army and built in secrecy at the University of Pennsylvania's Moore School of Electrical Engineering under the codename Project PX. Project PX, however, is now more commonly known as the Electronic Numeric Integrator and Computer, or ENIAC. The ENIAC was designed and created by John Malkley and J. Presper Eckert, and is considered the first fully functional digital computer. When the ENIAC was first announced in 1946, it was referred to as a giant brain, and it made scientists and industrials very enthusiastic. The ENIAC was a modular computer that was made up of specific panels to complete distinctive actions. Some of these modules were capable of adding and subtracting, along with holding a 10-digit decimal number in their memory. Numbers were transferred through the units across buses, and in order to manage its high speed, the buses had to send and receive numbers, compute, save the answer, and activate the next question. And this was all completed without moving components. It was a mammoth of a machine which weighed approximately 50 tons, took up roughly 1,800 square feet, and used nearly 18,000 vacuum tubes. It also used 200 kilowatts of electricity and took about $500,000 to create. Even though the ENIAC was not completely finished until the end of World War II, it was created and used for the purpose of determining artillery firing tables for the United States Army's Ballistic Research Laboratory. Although history had already seen its first programmable computer in The Colossus, a new electrical computer was on the rise which would be able to store programs on its own. This computer went by the name of the Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator, or EDSAC. The EDSAC is a British computer which was created by Morris Wilkes at the University of Cambridge. The EDSAC's memory consisted of 1,024 locations, however, only 512 of them were originally enforced. Each contained 18 bits, but due to timing restraints, 
only 17 were used. For memory, the EDSAC used delay lines, and it used vacuum tubes for logic. EDSAC began serving the research needs of the university as soon as it became viable. It was used to discover a 79-digit prime number, which was the largest known at the time. It was also the computer which ran the first graphical computer game, and that was nicknamed Baby. Like the EDSAC, the Universal Automatic Computer 1, or UNIVAC 1, was also considered to be one of the first computers which was able to store programs on its own. Like the ENIAC before it, the UNIVAC 1 was also designed by J. Presper Eckert and John Mockley. The UNIVAC 1 was also the second commercial computer which was produced in the United States. It featured 5,200 vacuum tubes and weighed around 13 metric tons. It used 125 kilowatts of energy and performed 1,905 operations per second. The UNIVAC's memory was made up of 1,000 words of 12 characters. The numbers were written as 11 decimal digits and the 1,000 words of memory had 100 channels of 10 word line registers. A total of 46 UNIVAC 1s were made with the starting price of $160,000. They eventually rose in price until they ended up being between $1.25 million and $1.5 million. The fifth UNIVAC 1 machine that was built was even used by CBS to help predict the results of the 1952 presidential election. The machine only had a sample size of 1% of the voting population and famously predicted Eisenhower winning by a landslide, even though it seemed his opponent, Stevenson, was favored. In computers today, RAM is a very important component. Up until this period of time, computers use relays, mechanical counters, or delay lines for their memory. This was until the invention of the Whirlwind 1 machine. The Whirlwind 1 was a vacuum tube computer which was developed in 1951 at MIT. It was amongst the first digital electronic computer that worked in real-time output and it was also the first that was not just an electronic replacement of an older system. The design for the Whirlwind came as a request from the U.S. Navy. They approached MIT about creating a computer which could be used as a flight simulator in order to train bomber crews. The design that they foresaw was one which would be able to constantly refresh a simulated instrumental panel, which would be based on control inputs from pilots. Originally, the design for the machine was calling for 2,000 words of 16 bits each of random access storage. At the time, the only two memory storage technologies which could hold that were delay lines and electrostatic storage. The delay lines proved to be too slow and unreliable for the machine to function as properly as intended. The other form of memory in which they had to rely on was electrostatic memory. There were many different types of electrostatic memory tubes, however, the best known was the Williams tube. Whirlwind engineers were debating on using Williams tube, but the dynamic storage and the necessity for frequent refresh cycles was incompatible with their design goals they instead decided to go with a design which was being developed at MIT, 
which was a dual gun electron tube. One gun created a beam to read or write individual bits, and the other provided the entire screen with low energy electrons. This design resulted in the creation of static RAM. The second generation brought about the replacement of the vacuum tube with a device called the transistor. Second generation computers still depended on punch cards for input and printouts for output. Invented in 1947, the transistor did not gain traction until the mid to late 1950s. It was vastly superior to vacuum tubes and they provided computers with the opportunity to become faster, smaller, more energy efficient, cheaper, and more reliable. The computers during the second generation changed from binary machine languages to assembly languages which would allow programmers to give instructions in words. There was also high-level programming languages that were advancing during this time period. This raises the question of what a transistor actually is. A transistor is a semiconductor device which is used to magnify and switch electronic signals and power. It is created with at least three terminals in order to connect to an external circuit. A current that is applied to one of the transistor terminals then alters the current through another pair of terminals. Since the output power can be greater than the input power, a transistor is able to amplify signals. Transistors are the central ingredient in modern electric devices and it helped pave the way for the field of computers. The transistorized experimental computer Zero, or referred to as the TX Zero, was one of the first fully transistorized computers created back in 1955. Like the whirlwind before it, the TX Zero was also developed at MIT and was essentially the same machine except it ran on transistors. Where the whirlwind took up an entire floor of a large building, the TX0 fit into a single decently sized room and was still faster. It was a full 16-bit computer with a 16-bit access range and 16-bit operations. It also allowed for 16 bits of data and 2 bits of instruction along with having a word size of 18 bits. The success of the TX0 led to the development of more complex machines such as the TX1 and the TX2. Produced in 1959, the Program Data Processor 1 or PDP-1 was the first computer in Digital Equipment Corporation's PDP series. The PDP-1 was the first mini-computer developed, and it is distinguished for being the computer most relevant in the formation of the hacker culture at MIT. The PDP-1 was based off of the design of the TX0 computer. However, the PDP-1 was quickly favored over the TX0. It used an 18-bit word size having 4096 words as a main memory, and it used 2700 transistors. The PDP-1 was the platform that served for many firsts in the computing world. One of the best known firsts is that it was the first mini computer to run a video game, which was called Space War. Also among this computer's firsts, our first word processor, text editor, credible computer chess program, interactive debugger, and some of the earliest computerized music. The 
the third generation brought about the creation of the integrated circuit. The integrated circuit allowed transistors to be condensed and placed onto silicon chips, which were called semiconductors. These severely increased the speed and efficiency of computers. The third generation also meant the end for using punch cards and printouts for input and output. And instead, users now interacted with their computers through use of keyboards and monitors which interfaced with an operating system. This allowed the computer to run many applications at once. This also marked a time where computers became available to a wide audience since they became smaller and cheaper than ever before. A forerunner idea to the integrated circuit was to build small ceramic squares which would hold a single miniaturized component. The components would then be integrated into a bi or tri dimensional compact grid. This promising idea would be proposed to the US Army by Jack Kilby and led to the micro module program. As this project was gaining traction, Kilby came up with another design, the integrated circuit. Kilby registered his original ideas for the integrated circuit while working for Texas Instruments in 1958 and ended up demonstrating a successful integrated circuit example in the same year. A very famous observation was made in 1965 by Gordon Moore who was the co-founder of Intel. His observation was that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit was doubling every year since the creation of the integrated circuit. He predicted that this trend would continue for the foreseeable future. In later years, the pace slowed down slightly, however, Data density has doubled approximately every 18 months, and this is the definition of Moore's Law. Most experts believe Moore's Law will hold for at least another two decades. The fourth generation of computers was brought about by the creation of the microprocessor, which allowed thousands of integrated circuits to be built onto a single chip. This greatly reduced the size of the computer. The size of a modern microprocessor is only about one square inch. During the first generation, something that took up an entire room would now be able to fit into the palm of your hand. The microprocessor is a multi-purpose programmable device which takes digital data as inputs. It then takes the digital data and processes it according to instructions which are stored in the memory and provides the results as the output. The assimilation of an entire CPU onto a single or few chips greatly lowered processing power costs. Before microprocessors, small computers had been using racks of circuit boards with many small and medium scale integrated circuits. Microprocessors integrated this into one or a few large scale integrated circuits. The first microprocessor created was done so by Intel Corporation, and it was called the Intel 4004. It was the first microprocessor, along with being the first general purpose programmable microprocessor on the market. The chip design started in 1970, but wasn't completed until 1971. The first commercial sale of the Intel 4004 
was to Busicom Corporation of Japan, of which it was originally designed and built as a custom chip. Later in the same year, the 4004 was made available to the general market. It was history's first uniform CPU fully integrated in one small chip. This was made possible by use of the new silicon gate technology, which allowed double the number of random logic transistors and an increase of speed. The dream of a machine that can think went from a mechanical one to a digital one. Soon, nearly half of the jobs in America would use computers, and within the decade, microprocessors would be placed everywhere, such as automobiles, scientific instruments, or electrical devices, increasing their functionality and reliability. Education and businesses would be changed forever thanks to computers, and even now, the evolutions of computers has not finished. They have already changed how we live, and they will continue to shape that even more so in the future. Software will become more powerful, and computers will continue to become faster, smaller, and cheaper. Minds that have yet to be assembled will design this power to create new wonders unimaginable to us today.